Happy New Year's, everybody. I hope you are doing awesome. I hope you had a great Christmas. Um, I hope you're having a great week. Um, I hope you're having a great year. I hope you're, everything's just going great for you. Uh, as you probably know by now, at the end of the year, we are online only. The last Sunday of the year, we're online only. Uh, the reason for that is because it, it, it does take a lot of people to carry out a worship service. And so in order that people can enjoy the last week of the year with their friends and family, uh, we just want to give all of our difference, maker, difference makers and our other staff the week off. So thank you for uh, joining us online today. And also, yes, I did say we take the last Sunday of the year off, and I know that this is the first Sunday of the year, but just disregard that. Um, hey, you are about to watch something really special. Uh, today, the only thing that we have in store for you is that we've, we've got a sermon and then we've got some announcements afterwards, but the sermon you're about to watch is the very first sermon we ever had at Essential Church. In fact, it was even before we launched, it was our very first preview service back in 2015. And in this sermon, we really talk about why we are starting this church. Um, as you know, there's lots of great churches all over Huntsville and Madison and all over the area. So, so why start another one? That is what this sermon is is all about. So um, I hope it's helpful to you as I rewatched this sermon, I was actually blown away. Um, all the things we said we were gonna do about seven years ago, um, and God has just been so good to us, and, and uh, here we are. So uh, with that said, um, man, enjoy this sermon. One last thing, I am wearing the most awkward outfit you have ever seen, so please forgive me um, in advance. Love you guys, I'll see you afterwards. Amen. Wow. Okay. What a first service. This is amazing. This is amazing. We actually had to start bringing in some extra chairs. This is, this is fantastic. Well, if you're new to the Essential Story, welcome to our very first service ever. I, I can't believe you guys are here. This is, this is amazing. This is a result of months and months and months of praying and sacrificing, and it means so much that you guys are with us this morning. So today, we're going to be talking about what's essential to you? What's essential to you? Uh, I, I'd like to actually hear from you. Uh, I'm going to count to three, and then I want each of you to yell out loud one thing that's essential to you. You ready? One, two, three. All right. I didn't hear a single word. I just heard a lot of words. So very nice. So when I was practicing uh, this week, I was obviously uh, just trying to be sure I had something to talk about for Sunday, getting ready. And I was practicing in front of my wife, Kristen. And I, it was just, she and I we were in the living room. And I said, Kristen, I want you to yell out something that's important to you. And I did one, two, three. And she said, shampoo. Shampoo. So uh, I don't know if yours was better or worse than shampoo, but I had to make that in because that's not what I, I was expecting her to say. What I was expecting some of you to say was perhaps if we were being honest this morning, maybe your comfort is essential to you. Is your comfort essential to you? What about your career? Is your career essential to you? What about your ambitions? What about living out your dreams, pursuing happiness what about some good things, some great things? What about your health? Is your health essential to you? There's a lot of things that could be essential, but this morning, I want us to see what did Jesus say should be essential. So we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 22. Uh, if you will, pull your Bible out, turn it on, click the Matthew 22, or if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We've got volunteers who are passing out Bibles right now. You just raise your hand, they'll give you one of these. This is a, a free gift for you. If you need a Bible, you can keep that. You can take it home with you. You don't have to steal it, it's yours. Um, if you don't need it, just leave it in your seat afterwards. And to make it just a little bit easier for everybody picking up a Bible right now, uh, one of the ones we're passing out, we're on page 571. Page 571. We're gonna be Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. Now, as you are getting to that passage, let me give you a little background. Let me tell you about the scene we're about to step onto. Back in the day of Jesus, the Israelites, there were really two main uh, groups. You had the Pharisees and you had the Sadducees. And they would, they would debate 
about which of the laws was most important. And, and many of us were actually probably familiar with some of the Old Testament laws. The Ten Commandments, anybody heard of the Ten Commandments? Like that was part of it, but, but there was more than just the Ten Commandments. In fact, you can look and there's actually over 600 different laws that the Israelites were to keep and, and these different groups would debate about which is most important. And today we're going to read because a Pharisee, a lawyer, actually pulled Jesus into this debate and asked Jesus, which is the most important? So if you will read with me, Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The main point this morning is that it is essential to love God and to love others. As my wife and I, as we began sensing that God was leading us to start this church, uh, way before we even started thinking about names of a church, uh, the name Essential came to mind, and it just wouldn't leave. We, we kept thinking about other names, but Essential, it stuck. Why? Because we want to lead the people of Huntsville to focus on what's essential. There's a lot of great things we can focus on, but we want to focus on loving God and loving others. Maybe you're here and you got suckered into coming this morning. Maybe your team lost last night and you lost a bet and that's why you're at church this morning. Maybe you're here because somebody offered an invite and you were being kind to them. But you haven't bought into the, the church thing or the Jesus thing. I, I just want to pause and I want to say, I'm glad you're here. If, if you thought the church wasn't for you, I've got some good news. We started this church for you. We started this church for people who thought the church would never be for them, for people who thought Jesus wasn't going to be their thing. I'd also like to submit to you that you and I, I believe we're actually after the same thing. I, I think you and I are after the same thing. I, I, I think we're both looking for something that could be described as true life. I, I think we're both looking for truth, if truth does exist, I think we're both looking for it. I think you were looking for meaning. I think we're looking for identity. I think we're looking for joy. I think we're looking for peace. I think each one of us is looking for love. And if that is you, if you're here this morning and you are seeking something that could be described as true life, I want to finally submit to you that it is essential that you follow Christ. Now back to our passage Matthew chapter 22, there's really two main parts. Jesus was asked, in a sense, what is essential? And he said, loving God and loving others. Let's explore both of those. First, loving God, loving the Lord your God with all your soul, all your mind, all your heart. When I was in the sixth grade, I was asked an existential question, a question about my very existence. I was sitting in one of those desk chairs in the sixth grade at Challenger Middle School. You got any Challenger students or alumni? Yes, go Eagles. I think we're the Eagles, are we the Eagles? Go Challenger. And I was sitting there in the sixth grade and my teacher dropped this bomb on me, right? She, she said, all students, please write down the top 10 most important things to you and at the end of the class, you're going to present to one another. Now, something you need to know about me. At that point, I had already, the best that an 11-year-old could, could understand, I had already decided I was going to follow Christ. I knew how much Jesus loved me. At the best that an 11-year-old could understand, and I wanted to follow Jesus. So keep that in mind, because it's, it's about to become rele relevant. So here I am, I'm writing down my top 10 list. Not much better than what my wife yelled out earlier, shampoo. At number one, I wrote my Nintendo. I do not remember what number two or number three was. I don't remember any of the numbers, actually, except for number four. I remember writing the word God. And it troubled me. It troubled me. I, 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 even at the age of 11, I, I didn't feel quite right about no, uh, Nintendo being number one when, when God was number four. I mean, number four doesn't even get a trophy. You know what I mean? It's not even top three. And here I was 
right in God. Now, is that an issue? Yes and no, right? No, it's not an issue. I was 11, right? I was off the cuff exercise. Now, the real tragedy here is that because we were presenting it to the class, I, I wrote it in marker, unlike the number two pencil like I was supposed to use. And so here I had to present, and, and with like beads of sweat coming down my forehead, I tell the class that my Nintendo and a couple other things, and then somewhere down the list is God. But if we were being honest, don't we do that even now? Those of us who've been following Christ for a long time, whether it would be consciously or subconsciously, don't we put other things ahead of God all the time? Maybe something silly like shampoo or Nintendo, or maybe something serious. Maybe your career, maybe some relationships, maybe your ambitions, maybe your health, maybe your comfort. So what's the solution? What should our response be? Because if you are following Christ, you know exactly what I mean. We know, we have a head knowledge that God should be the most important thing, but constantly we put our other things in the number one spot. So what should our response be? Our response should be to constantly refocus on what's essential. We must constantly refocus on what's essential. It's not a one-time thing. It's a constant. We must constantly refocus let me illustrate. Imagine, uh, well, actually, let me ask this. Do we have any fans of Walmart in the house this morning? Raise your hand. Do not be ashamed. The lights are down dim. Um, like, you just need to relax, and so you go walk a lap or two at Walmart. That's you? All right, what about, what about Target? We got any Target fans? All right, all right, Target's winning. Lots of Target fans. All right, imagine you are in Target and you have to run in for a couple of essential items. You're there for bread and for milk. And you've got your little shopping and you're going all the way to the back of the store because that's where they, they stuff those things. And you're picking up the essential. But by the time you leave, right, you're heading for the cash register and you start putting all these other things into your, into your buggy. Right, you get some bacon, you get some candy, you start going down the veggie row, you actually get some really great things, you get some uh, tomatoes, some, veg, uh, some uh, 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 bananas, you get all these important things, and then you're like, hey, I, I gotta get one more thing while I'm at Target, let me get, I've been looking for that pair of shoes, let me put that in the buggy, and then you, you get to the cash register, and you, you were looking for two things, but you have an entire shopping buggy full of things. And if you were to exaggerate this example just a little bit further, you would see that you do not have enough strength or energy to take care of all of these things. And the same thing with our lives. We have just enough time to do what's essential. God has given us enough time to do what's essential, loving God and loving others. You start adding a lot of other things to that list, you're not gonna have the time, you're not gonna have the energy, and you're going to become distracted. God has given us enough time to do what's essential. And the first thing that we see in Matthew 22 is that it is essential to love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your soul, and all your heart. And the second is like it, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Wherever you live, you need to take responsibility for, your, for the people in your city. If you live here in Huntsville, you need to take responsibility for the people here. Nobody else is coming here to take the responsibility for the people of Huntsville. We must be willing to sacrifice, to love the people of our city as ourselves. We must be willing to even lay down our lives for the people of our city. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament is the first part of the Bible. It's a collection of books that was written before Jesus came and, 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 and entered flesh and walked the earth. And in the Old Testament, we see a number of prophets. Prophets were these people who had, they had a message from God to deliver to some people. And we see two, we see a bunch of prophets, but I want to highlight two of them this morning. On the one hand, Jonah. On the other hand, Jeremiah. Jonah was given an amazing amazing assignment from God. God told Jonah to go deliver this message to the city of Nineveh. Not only that, God promised that those people would repent and begin following God. It was a sure win. God gave Jonah a, a easy, amazing assignment. And Jonah kicked and screamed the entire way. It's, it's actually, a tr it's almost a tragedy. I mean, Jonah in the end does do it. But he had a terrible attitude. The book of Jonah, it's four chapters. If you read it, it's almost comical 
how bad his attitude was. On the other hand, we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah was given the worst circumstances. Jeremiah was a spiritual leader for his people, the Israelites, and the Israelites were invaded, they were conquered, they were enslaved, and they were exiled to a land, not their own. And do you know what Jeremiah's instructions to his people were? Was it to go kicking and screaming? Nope. Jeremiah instructed his people to go and to seek the good of the people where they were going. So you have these two prophets. You have one, amazing circumstances, a terrible attitude. And on the other hand, you have terrible circumstances, but amazing attitude. And which better represents you today? We are called to love our neighbor as ourself. Which better represents you? Jonah or Jeremiah? Laying down our life for our community. It can look like a lot of different things. Few of us, if any, in this room will be actually called to physically lay down our lives for others. But all of us are called to serve our community. There is a difference between living for something and being willing to die for something. And we all instinctively know this. Now imagine, uh, if, if I were to uh, come, arrive at my house in the middle of the afternoon and I see that it's on fire, a, ma a big fire, and I know that my wife and kids are in there, I will run into that fire to hopefully save them, even if it costs me my own life. And I'm not a hero. Other people have actually done that, right? We, we see that in the news and stories all the time. People who sacrifice their lives for others. However, if you were to come to my house at 2 a.m. and peek in the window, which would be super creepy, but if you were to do that, and I was tucked in bed, and my oldest daughter is crying because she wants just a little bit more milk or, or because I had given her the wrong bottle. I gave her the red bottle when she wanted the green bottle. And if you would have peeked into that situation, you would see there is a difference between willing to die for someone and willing to live for something. I would gladly go into the flames for her, but if she's crying at 2 a.m., you're on your own. Many times my wife and I were sitting in the living room, room in the afternoon and like we're reading, we're talking, we're doing whatever. And then I get up from my seat and immediately she asks, will you get me a cup of water? I'm like, lady, I, I know you've been wanting that water for so long. You've just been waiting until I get up to ask for it because you didn't want to go get it. The same woman I'd be willing to die for. It's not easy to lay my life down for her in other ways. Let me give you one more illustration. I didn't ask for permission to share this story, but oh well. <laughs> Anybody here have the recent stomach bug? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Like if you're so, you know, it was intense. I'm talking about the fall of 2015. You heard it here, folks. I'm calling it the stomach apocalypse. It was nasty, and so many people have had this thing. Uh, if you did not raise your hand, I just want to tell you, you're a champion. Like I don't know how you made it. You did it. A little advice, a little advice. Um, don't shake the hand of someone who just raised their hand. You know what I mean? It was contagious. <laughs> All right, so a few weeks ago, my youngest daughter got it first. And then my oldest daughter. And then about 7 p.m., my wife got it. And at this point, I'm still feeling pretty good. And so from 7 p.m. Uh, onward, I'm just doing my best to take care of them. I'm trying to get them Gatorade and salting crackers and doing laundry, doing all, the, all those things that you do when you're trying to care for somebody with the stomach bug. Have you ever heard about an animal? Many times, many animals, they do this, that when it's, uh, if it's in a pack of other animals, it will actually, if it knows it's about to die, it'll actually get up and go die in isolation. Have you ever heard of this? This is, this is a real thing. You can Wikipedia it. Um, it, it, it. I think it's for the, you know, for the safety and the health of the other animals. Well, at about 4 a.m., that's what I did. I, we were all in the master bedroom taking care of everybody, and then at 4 a.m., I was overcome. And so I silently left the bedroom and found myself in the fetal position of my empty three-year-old's bed. And as I was laying there about 4 a.m., one last desperate plea for help. I, I reach into my pocket, I pull out my cell phone, and I call my dad. I call my dad, and I basically said, Dad, I need you to come over here and die with us. You know, I, I mean, everybody's got it. We've fallen like dominoes. You're next. Will you please come? And do you know what? He came. He came. 
He answered that phone call at 4 a.m. He drove across town at 4 a.m. And he spent the rest of our day with the terror of the stomach bug coming upon him next. And he did that. If, if comfort was on his essential list, he wouldn't have come. He wouldn't have answered the phone. He wouldn't have driven across town. He wouldn't have come. If, if his health was on his essential list, he wouldn't have come. He, 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 he might would have maybe asked a nurse to come or so. Hey, why don't you guys drive to the hospital? You're not far. Uh, if comfort was on his list or health, he, he, he wouldn't have come. But because loving his neighbor as himself was on his list, he came. And when we refocus on what's essential, we'll go. And when we see the hundreds of people who are in this room right now, willing to lay down our lives for our community, we see a movement. We see a movement. My dream for this, one of my dreams, I have lots of dreams for this church, one of my dreams is that people would look at the movement of God in downtown Huntsville and they say, I want that in my city. I'm not even a Christian. You know, somebody, they're like, I'm not even a Christian, but I want those Christians in my city because they love God, they love others, they're even willing to lay down their lives for their neighbor. I want that for each one of us individually. I want that for us as a church, as a whole. We are honored. The principal of this school, Stephanie Wiesman, is with us this morning. Stephanie, where are you? Raise your hand. She's in the back. What a servant. Can we just say thank you, Stephanie, for letting us meet here this morning? <laughs> Stephanie, we are, we're so grateful that you let us meet here. And we just want to show the community that, like, listen, like, we're... We do not want something from you. We want something for you. We came here so we can lay down our lives for you. So, the, so today, we're going to do something a little special. During our time of offering, it's a, it'll be in a few minutes. Uh, anything that is donated in the, the offering buckets today, we're going to go right in return and donate 100% of that to this school. Just to say thank you. To say, listen, we don't want anything from you. We want to be a blessing to you. And what better way to start than starting at the school that meets here. I mean, starting at the school where we meet. And I, I don't care what your background is. Maybe this is your first time to church. Maybe you've been in church your entire life. I, I think we can agree upon something. That we care about the young people of our community. And we want to make investments in them. And I think this is an amazing way we're going to do that. So everything that's donated uh, in the time of offering today, we're going to turn around and donate 100% of that to the school just to say thank you. We are prepared to lay down our lives for you. And if you ever need anything, you call us first. Christians in a room, we must stay focused on what's essential, loving God and loving others. But you can't. You can't. You can't in your own strength. Here's why. We could come to a meeting like this and we get really excited, right? We get pumped up. We can hear these stories. We can be like, yes, yes, I want to get refocused. And then we walk into the office tomorrow morning and we're already so busy, but another project falls into our lap. Or you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad and you wake up and one of your kids is sick or you're a student and you get a grade. It's not what you hoped for. And the wind is knocked out of our sails. We were so excited, but we got to get back to life. And if we're just trying to do it on our own strength, that wind will always get knocked out of our sails. If we're just trying to beat upon our will, we won't be able to do it. The way that day in, day out, day in, day out, we can focus on what's essential is when we come to a passage like we just read, Matthew 22, and we allow it to melt our hearts, melt our hearts into the image of Jesus. When we think about at what great cost Jesus came for us, that's what allows us to go day in, day out, loving him and loving others. If you're the, in the room this morning and you're not so sure what, what I meant when I said at what great cost Jesus came for us. Let me share. God created the world. God created everything, including us. And he made it perfectly. And then because God knew that we were all looking for certain things, we were looking for identity, we were looking for meaning, we were looking for peace, we are looking for joy, we are looking for lo uh, love, because God knew that we would need those things, God gave us certain parameters to live within. And each one of us have stepped outside of those parameters. We've all said that, God, you know, I hear you, but I've got a better way. And we stepped outside of those parameters. And here's the real problem. 
that our God, our creator, he's a just God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. And when the created does not obey the creator, that's a problem. That's a problem. A price has to be paid for that. Imagine, imagine with me for just one moment, your house gets ransacked. People come in, they break in, they steal, they destroy everything. And then they, and then they catch the guys, right? You call the police, they catch them. And then, and then they, the, the, the people who are arrested, they go before the judge. And the judge says, I forgive you. You're good. Go. Do it no more. How would that make you feel? How would it make you feel if your house was ransacked and you were left floating the bill because the judge let you off? We have a holy and a righteous God and a price had to be paid for that when we sinned and we disobeyed our creator. But we also have a loving and a gracious God, a God who is just and righteous and holy, yes, a God who is loving and merciful and graceful, yes. And there was only one appropriate solution and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is God, stepped in humanity. He lived a perfect life. He lived perfectly within the parameters that this world was supposed to be lived within, therefore satisfying God's holiness. And then Jesus did the unthinkable. He died for us. He died for you. The one who deserved to live took our place. Therefore, satisfying God's love and mercy and grace. And the Bible could not be more clear. Anybody who believes that Jesus is who he said he was, that he was God, that on the third day he rose, anybody who believes of that, and they acknowledge that they had been doing it their own way, they had been trying to live life the way that they wanted to live it, they've not been doing it the way God wanted them to live it. And then anyone who just confesses that, right? Like if that's you, like you're like, you're like man, I, that's me, Tim, you're talking right to me. I know I've not done it the right way. I know I have done it my own way. And I do believe God is, Jesus is who he said he was. Then come confess that. Like say it out loud. Whoever brought you, come and say that. Or in just a few minutes, like I'm gonna be in the back, come and tell me. Come and tell me I want to follow Jesus. Because here's why. Here's another reason maybe I should say. After Jesus died for us, on the third day he rose. And then he appeared to all of his disciples and then over 500 other people who claimed to have an interaction with the risen Jesus. And then to this very day, millions, depending on who you ask, billions of people claim to have a relationship with this Jesus. And I am one of them. And if you are looking for peace, Jesus. If you're looking for truth, if you're looking for identity, if you're looking for a meaning or a purpose, if you're looking for love, Jesus. I'm not sure why you're here today. But for some of you, I I believe this church will be your first exposure to truth. For some of you, I, I believe this church will be your first exposure to grace. For some of you, I think this church is gonna be your symbolic rebellion against doing it your own way. For some of you, I think this church is gonna be a symbolic rebellion against legalism. Every time I do something wrong, I don't think God loves me, and you rebel against that. For some of you, I think this church is gonna be your anchor. You've been looking for a community for years. You found it. For some of you, this church is gonna be a movement that you step in, a community, a a movement that goes into our community with a radical generosity that says, I am ready to lay down my life for you because one greater than me laid down his life for I. For some of you, this church is gonna be your fortress. You're beat up, you're tired. You've had enough, you're done. We will come around you. This church will be a safe place. If you're ever here and it feels like an unsafe place, come and talk to me. You can find my contact information all over our website and a number of places. You come and talk to me. If you feel safe, unsafe somewhere else, come talk to me. You have no idea how serious I am that this church will be a source of strength, of hope, of love, and of protection for the people of Huntsville. You have no idea how serious I am of that. And this morning, what a great group. 
you can start movements with groups like this. And if you look around, we're not like each other. This is a diverse group. Many of you are going to vote different ways. You think different ways. You have very different jobs. You live in very different neighborhoods. But we come together focused. We are here focused on the essential. We love God. We love others. Let's start this church. You guys ready to start this church? Let's start this church. The band is going to start coming up right now. Or whenever they feel like it. I'm just kidding. Take your time. The band's going to start coming up right now. And I'm going to ask all of you to consider doing one of two things. If you're here and you need to take the next step in your faith, like you're like, I... I, I sense that God is leading me to do this. I want to become a Christ follower. I'm looking for that peace. I'm looking for that joy. I'm looking for that love. I'm ready to follow Christ. Come and talk to me. I'm going to be in the back, kind of like back behind, like at the back of this room, back of the gym. When, when the band comes up here, they're going to play two songs. That's going to last, I don't know, seven, ten minutes. Muster up enough courage to come talk to me in the next seven to ten minutes. Or maybe there's another next step. Maybe you're like, I, I've been following God for a long time, but I've, I've never read my Bible before. If you'd like to learn how to do that, come talk to me or one of our leaders in the back of this room. For everyone else, maybe you're like, you know what, I, I do love God. I, I do love others. But if I were being honest this morning, I've put a lot of other things on that essential list. I'm going to ask you to do something to get you outside of your comfort zone this morning. And, and you don't have to do anything, but I'm going to ask you to consider doing this. For these next two songs, come up here to the front, to the front of the floor. And if you just need to refocus, just spend these next two songs praying, asking God, help me to refocus. Help me to refocus on loving you and loving others. And I know it might make you feel uncomfortable getting out of your seat and coming doing this, but I'm going to ask you to get outside your comfort zone and just a, a symbolic act of coming to the front and saying, God, I do love you. I'm willing to lay down my life for others and I need to refocus and I want to do that right now. I do not want to leave this place unfocused. Let's start this church. Let's start this church. Hey, thank you um, for being here today. Just a couple things I want to share. Beginning this coming Saturday, the 7th, January 7th, we resume our normal schedule. So Saturday, 5 p.m. service. Sunday morning, the 8th, we have a 9.30 service and 11 o'clock service, just like normal. And of course, Madison is back with us next Sunday as well at 10 a.m. at Heritage Elementary. Hey, I hope you have a great week. May God bless you. Again, Happy New Year, and we'll see you next weekend.